There we go. All right, so we are here together to do um, to do this workshop on retrospectives and agile teams, the real deal. One of the reasons I'm calling it the real deal is that um, you know we're we're actually going to design a retrospective, and I and also this is really how it works when people get together to. Um, you know, work on improving together as as we're going to be looking at in a minute. So um, let's let's get started. And despite what you may have heard elsewhere, this is how retrospectives really really work and have uh, good outcomes. So I, um, as I, if you were here for the earlier talk, you've uh, you heard about this. Um, this is me. I've I've created uh, different models, and I love working with other people's models all my working life. Uh, during this this talk, this workshop, we'll be working a lot with the materials from the Agile Retrospectives book. We'll be working with the materials a little bit from the Agile Fluency model, and we'll be looking at um, the uh, five rules for accelerated learning. All of those work really well together when we're thinking about uh, when we're thinking about doing retrospectives. I'm also going to want to learn a little bit about you. So um, as we go through. Um, I just I hope you jot down the questions that you have as we go along and uh, think about the teams that you want to work with and that you want to create or the groups of people that you want to create retrospectives for. You know, keep your own needs in mind as we move through this workshop and uh, I hope you'll, that will help with your ability to have some takeaways at the end to some degree that your own learning is in your hands and I will try to create um, the best possible flow of content for you so that we can make that happen. So we're going to do a learning journey together. Um, we're going to talk about why we even think about doing retrospectives for a little while. Then I will introduce the framework for Agile retrospectives, the thing that we know really works to help people who are trying to improve together um, and on all their all the dimensions there. Then we'll talk a little bit about understanding team needs, um, kinds of learning and improvement our team's working on, and we'll use the Agile Fluency model as a as a lens to look at that. And then, um, when then we'll talk about how to incorporate the five rules for learning in your retrospectives to make sure that the maximum amount of learning and improvement can happen. And then, as I said, uh, at the end, we will, you'll design your own retrospective and um, that'll be great fun. So, um, we are, I'm going to, this is kind of in the wrong place for me, and I'm going to make this a little bigger. There we go. So maybe everybody can get a better view. There we go. So um, the manifesto for agile software development, or what we often call the, just the agile manifesto, because that's the URL that they created. Um, at it, the very last principle, there's the 12, there's the four val, uh, statements of value, this over that, and then there is the second page that has 12 principles, uh, descriptions of when we are enacting those values, what do we see happening in teams. And the last one um, is principle 12. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. So the interesting thing was that uh, when Esther Derby and I were joining the Agile movement in the, you know, in 2000, 2001, um, in the early days, uh, what we discovered together was that um, there were no practices associated with this. CLEAR, Alistair Coburn's CLEAR had a reflection practice, but they didn't actually use that reflection, so they mostly just reflected. They didn't take the next step of actual action planning for improvement. And, and while in, reflection is important, and it's an important part of the retrospective, 
um, it's not all there is. And so that's why we decided to start doing workshops and write the book. And there were a lot of other people doing that along with us at the time. So some definitions. Uh, continuous improvement. This is from the American Society for Quality, ASQ. Uh, continuous improvement they define as an ongoing effort to improve products, services, or processes, seeking incremental improvement over time, some, what we sometimes call Kaizen, or break, breakthrough improvement all at once, what we call Kaikaku. Uh, another important definition for us is continuous learning, and this comes from businessdictionary.com, an ongoing learning process that seeks to incorporate lessons learned or from the results of already ex implemented changes into a continuous improvement program. So continuous learning and continuous improvement are connected, even just in the definitions. Uh, we learn in order to make change that we hope will improve us. And then uh, a quick uh, definition of retrospectives from uh, Esther in my book, Agile Retrospectives, a focused examination in the present during which the team inspects and learns from the past. So they inspect the past and they learn from that in order to influence and adapt future teamwork, methods, processes, and practices. So there's a lot of things that a retrospective might focus on, and it, but it always is some area where we think we could learn some new things and we think that learning will help us improve. So why would we, why do we spend time on Agile retrospectives? Well, you know, people have done some research. Intel did some research. Some other folks have done some research. And what they've discovered is that when Agile retrospectives are done well, they see improvements. They see greater team productivity. They see more team member capability. They see product quality increasing. They see um, increased team capacity, collaboration skills improve. Um, when some one time somebody came to me and said that he um, he had learned the secrets of retrospectives and and uh, and I said, well, I didn't think we were keeping any secrets. What is it? And he said, if your if your retrospectives go well, all your other meetings and working together goes well too. So collaboration skills improve through doing effective retrospectives, and that creates better team morale. And and depending on the focus of the retrospectives, in larger ones like release retrospectives and things that include people people outside the team, it helps to improve cross-organizational working relationships. So there's a lot of good reasons to do retrospectives and to do them well. There's a why behind them. We are looking at improving these things. We aren't doing them just to say, oh, well, we did the retrospective this week. Retrospectives are held at different times for different purposes. Uh, in a lot of the folks who are doing ensemble or mob programming, we are uh, hearing stories about uh, a very, very short retrospective after every Pomodoro. It, looking at that, just that small chunk of work or after, after a few Pomodoros and then that small chunk of work that might be just, you know, three 25-minute segments and then saying, okay, now that we did that, is there something here that we think we can improve? One small thing. And thinking about, then, you know, what, what did we notice? What did we notice during this, these periods of time? Um, who's got something that they think we could tweak to make things better? And then how will we incorporate that as we move along? So Pomodoro, then oftentimes I hear about folks doing retrospectives on a daily basis, either at the end of the day or in the morning before the starting work. Um, certainly we're more familiar with the sort of iteration, sprint, or in the case of Kanban, some regular cadence of retrospective that the team has chosen. Um, sometimes there's a, a, a retrospective that's just done as an overview. We've done a lot of those short retrospectives, and now we need one to sort of tie it all together. What have we learned across the board over a, a little longer period of time? 
Then there are retrospectives that just focus on how did this release go? What, what happened specifically to move us toward this release and how can we improve our next release effort? And then, of course, um, end of project or big major deliveries. And, um, and then something we call surprise retrospectives, which uh, retrospective, when something happens that um, is unexpected, um, oftentimes a, doing a quick retrospective about what were we just doing, how can we, you know, what does that tell us about how we want to respond to this surprising event and how do we want to move forward can be an, a, a really excellent way of dealing with that situation. Retrospectives aren't just feedback. Um, the term retrospective often gets used at the end of a workshop or something, um, which is really a debrief or a feedback session. Um, retrospectives really are this, this um, learning and improvement as a group, not giving feedback to somebody else so that they can, in, and they can improve, which is a valuable thing to do. It's just not necessarily a formal retrospective. Oops. So um, in the book, Agile Retrospectives, Making Good Teams Great, Esther and I introduced what we call the flexible, scalable framework for retrospectives. And it really is this, this um, right side of this graphic here that says, set the stage, gather data, generate insights, decide what to do, and then close the retrospective. Now, you know, all models are wrong and some are useful, right? The, the thing that's wrong about um, this particular uh, graphic is that it shows the retrospective as some people interpret it as taking as much time as the actual work that it is reflecting and, and it, on and intended to improve. And, of course, that's not true. But, um, get, you know, getting all the, the right words in and everything, it, it this was a good way to, to look at it. And, and so, but we, we hold the retrospective and then we go back into doing the work. We incorporate the experiments and improvement actions that we've identified. We build the product and we deliver that increment. Um, and then we hold another retrospective. So you can see this fits no matter whether you're doing a few Pomodoro retrospective at a time or a whole end of a very large project. Um, any of those, it's scalable so that any piece of work you can reflect on, you can do a retrospective on to improve your way of doing it the next time. And in fact, when Esther and I were writing the retrospective work, we did it in work chunks. We would get together for several days and just focus on writing the book. And at the end of that period of time, we would hold um, a short retrospective on what did that, how did we, how did it go and what do we want to do differently next time and, and began incorporating that. So we, the Agile Retrospective book recursively benefited by doing regular retrospectives um, at the end of each, you know, chunk of our work. So what is the work that goes on in retrospectives? Well, the team that is attending a retrospective, their job is to reflect, to learn on what they've been, learn about what they've been reflecting on, think about and analyze that, make decisions about what does that tell them about going forward, moving into action together. And the role of the facilitator of that, that meeting, that session, of course, is to provide opportunities, a group process, activities, um, some structure so that the team is able to do that reflecting, learning, thinking, deciding, and moving to action. So, um, in when this middle part, there, there, there are a couple of different ways of thinking about a retrospective. The set the stage and the close the retrospective, Esther and I incorporated because we knew that people wouldn't necessarily be, you know, experienced, trained facilitators. And we wanted to give them those hints that you really do need to kind of get people's heads in the room and, and, and then actually 
bring things to an end and, and leave it. But the real work of the retrospective happens in this these three middle parts. And um, this is where the adaptive action happens, the gather data, generate insights, and decide what to do. So this is linked to um, adaptive action learning. Actually, they were par it, these two were created in parallel, both um, and Glenda Oyang from the Human Systems Dynamics Institute and, and her colleagues and Esther and I drew from some of the same sources and in parallel came up with uh, our our two models. But I think the adaptive action learning model is a, is a really um, a good one to look at and it comes from, again, Human Systems Dynamics Institute. It, it talks about rapid cycles of data collection, meaning making, trying things out and then repeating that cycle. And that's very similar to what we are doing when we hold a retrospective. So we, the what, so what, now what? What is the data? How do we make meaning of that? And what will we do next? So let's look at the let's look at the parts of a retrospective. Um, we'll go through each of these, and I'm going to give you some examples of activities or group processes that you might use um, to if you are the person facilitating this retrospective. So we begin with set the stage. Setting the stage has to do with helping people kind of let go of the work that they were doing before, whether it's in, in many times, like in, for instance, for scrum teams or uh, extreme programming teams that might have be have doing a product demo or uh, a sprint review uh, that might have come before where you're showing the work of the sprint to to some audience. So we're, we need to let go of that and then move into the retrospective as a, as a new thing that we're working on. So um, there are a number of things we want to think about here. We want to have we want to show people that we've prepared. So I always show an agenda uh, to say, you know, this is, we're, we're not going to waste your time, right? Uh, we've, I've actually thought about, I've planned this, we've, we have an agenda for the work that we're going to do together. And then this is the focus. A focus for each retrospective keeps things from getting both boring, because if they always just focus on continuous improvement writ large, um, that becomes a very difficult challenge for the team. It's hard to keep engaged and keep momentum in that. But if you pick a particular slice, if you pick a particular focus for the retrospective, it's much easier to make incremental progress, which of course is, is what we're looking for. So in this, for this particular retrospective, the focus was what does our experience so far tell us about where where to tune and adjust going forward. So this is a very, it's a sprint zero. This team has just come together. Maybe they've only done a little bit of work together. So they're exploring that. Later on, they may have a focus that's more like, how do we engage better with our product owner? Or how do we engage better with our customers? Or how do we address the quality issues that just came up? In that, in that sprint demo or product demo that we just did. Um, it could be um, how do we, how do we um, incorporate more effective engineering practices. Slicing it down a little bit, so big enough so that's interesting, but small enough that we can make some actual progress in a, in a reasonable amount of time uh, through the retrospective. And then finally, Having, uh, showing what is the agenda, how are we going to use our time, it helps people to understand that this is not, um, that, that we have thought about this, we're, we're planning this out and we're not going to just, um, that we're going to use their time wisely and that we can tell how, it, how we're moving forward. So I often introduce um, also the retrospective prime directive, particularly in the early days of doing retrospectives. Um, regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could given. <laughs> now, everyone did the best job they could does not necessarily mean that that job was adequate or that that job did what we hoped it would do. 
right? So now we need to examine what happened in our working together, our teamwork system, that made that best job not good enough. Uh, so rather than blaming people, we're going to look systemically at how we work together. So everyone did the best job they could given what they knew at the time. Did they have the right information? Their skills and ability were the skills they have a good match for the thing that we were trying to do or our whole team skills did we have what we needed for the thing we were trying to do the resources available and I'm not talking about people here but I'm talking about equipment permissions uh, all kinds of things that we need to support our work going forward um, were, were those did we have what we needed to do the work and then the situation at hand um, you know uh, is it flu season where there are a lot of people out I mean there's there's all kinds of things that could be going on that would affect our ability uh, or would affect the the standard of best job that we were capable of during that period of time this prime directive comes from Norm Kurth uh, and his book Project Retrospectives. Um, it's a it's a really valuable thing to read his description of it and and his thinking behind it. But I just love it as a really good way to incorporate systems thinking uh, into the work of our teams. So it sets it up so that we know that this is not a blame session. Blame sessions are worthless. They don't really help move us forward. Uh, so what we're about here is to figure out how to learn about what we did and how to make it better so so that our best jobs become better over time. Um, another thing that we can do is a quick sort of check-in. Get everybody talking right in the beginning. Get them active as part of the setting the stage. And for that, I often turn to um, things like Retromat, um, which retromat.org I highly recommend as a resource and like and here you can see they there's a whole list of setting the stage activities that you can find on uh, on retromat about that will help the team get kind of into the retrospective you don't want to spend a lot of time here so most of these are very short you also might want to uh, now that we're working remotely all the time you might want to incorporate a tool like Miro or mural etc and you'll I, I have some I have a mix in this talk of pictures of flip charts that I've used on in-person retrospectives, but then also examples that um, I created in Miro. So um, particularly if you're used to using whiteboards or flip charts, shifting to these online um, platforms that allow us to do similar kinds of things is pretty easy. So um, I might do a quick question. I might add a quick question in my in my setting the stage so that everybody is kind of engaged in in the meeting before we really get to that meaty part so which is the gathering data so we're going to start gathering data now we everybody's present fully present they know the work we've got at hand they know what our focus is know how we're going to use our time we know we're not going to spend time blaming each other we've already shared some uh, short thing to to get us participating and talking so now gathering data uh, from now this I'm, I'm showing you this again in a photograph but um, but you could easily replicate this on on Miro or Mural or at you know I think they even there are even examples of this at Retrium and some of the other online retrospective tools. So um, this one is it is a way of gathering data about the period of time that we're looking at. This particularly works well for the shorter periods of time, um, like a sprint or an iteration. Um, and and the the step by step is that the team, each team member or in pairs, depending on the size of the team, um, takes some sticky notes and writes down some things that they remember happened um, over the course of the iteration the week the two weeks however long it was and um, and then and then we asked them to take those things that they remember happening and 
categorize them onto this chart, which is uh, the vertical is impact. Was it a, from a very, very positive impact to a very negative, maybe catastrophic impact at the bottom? Um, and then also, how often did this happen? Was this a, a one-off that happened? Or was it something that was going on all the time, all during the iteration? So we begin to get a picture of what is it, what did our retrospective look like from everyone's point of view? And that's the critical piece here. We all come from our, to the retrospective with our own experience of what happens, and we often think that's the whole picture. But in fact, every person had a different point of view, and so we want to make sure that those are all out on the whiteboard in this instance. Um, and and so that we can all have the complete picture before we start making choices. So FRIM, frequency and impact is what that's, that's from, um, is one way of doing that. A timeline is another way of doing that. Um, this is a, another one, and you can find this one on funretrospectives.com. Um, liked, lacked, Liked, learned, lacked, and sometimes people add in a fourth L called longed for, which we wish this had happened, um, is, a, is another activity where you can pull out some of those things. What, what happened that you really liked? What happened that you, what did you learn during the, um, during the iteration? What, what was missing for you? And um, what, what, what else do you wish had happened? So this is another another way, and it is in um, Paolo Caroli has just uh, created a new version of his Fun Retrospectives book. This is both online and in his book. Um, another thing, once we have those, once we have like, lack, learned, or once we have FRIM set up, we can use what we call pattern spotter questions. And this also comes from the Human Systems Dynamics Institute. Um, taking a step back, looking at what we have produced um, as a, the picture of our, um, of our iteration or our sprint, what do we? What kind of generalities can we can we identify here? What seems to what seems to be around all the time, and and where are the exceptions to that? Mostly we do this, but some once in a while this other thing happens, right? Where are the contradictions? On the one hand, we're really good at, but on the other hand, we that gets in our way when. On the one hand, on the other hand, where are the contradictions? What were the surprises? What still do we not understand? What still puzzles or mystifies us? And once we've been through a process like this, we probably have a pretty good idea of the data that we have to work with. Now, when we look at data, we're looking at actual physical data. We may also be looking at cycle time and, and other kind of metrics that we've been keeping. Um, and, we, and those may be incorporated as well as the, the kinds of uh, activities that I just showed you. Once we all have that shared picture, then we can begin to make sense. That's the what. And now we go into the so what. Let's begin to think about the uh, interpretations, uh, implications, insights that we can get from what, what we have just, just described happened. Um, one way of doing that is putting things on an activity we call circles and soup. And in this one, we have, again, have people use sticky notes or something. This is another one that you can easily set up on Miro or Mural or Jamboard or whatever your, your tool of choice is. Um, and we have the team write sticky notes uh, about what they have observed from the data that we've gathered where they think that there you know, are maybe some opportunities for improvement, and what, you know, what have they learned from that. And then we take those sticky notes and we put them on a, 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 on a graphic like this. I usually draw this on a big uh, whiteboard or I have some big, or I have it on a mural. And we put the sticky notes in the parts of the circle that um, 
they correspond to is so is this improvement action something or improvement idea something that the team could actually just do that have, they have control over they could take direct action is it something that the team can can influence but can't control so maybe um, we'll put the things in there and then we'll later on we'll think about the actions that the persuading or recommending actions that we could do in response to those things. And then finally the soup. Um, this is the parts of the, or the uh, culture, the processes, procedures that we have no control over and no influence over. Um, but we can, if we know the things that are bugging us there, we can take a response action. We can decide how we are going to respond when those things come into our purview. So here's some other examples of what that might look like. Here's some, um, in this team, almost everything, and then we ended up even having to expand the center circle because almost everything they identified turned out to be um, something that they could actually do something about um, in the left hand example in the right top example there were a lot more things that ended up out in the soup and in the influencing um, and here's another here's a, a description of a place where you can go online uh, gamestorming.com has a circles and soup um, online uh, so you can you can incorporate that rather than um, using whiteboards or flip charts or whatever so now we've got we've we've done some learning. So in the gathering data, we we're reflecting and thinking, remembering back what happened, and then to generate insights. We're now learning from that. What does that tell us? What did that you know? What did that thing that all that information? What what did we learn from that? What insights did it give us? So now we can move on to deciding what kind of improvement do where do we how do we want to move forward with the improvement. And for that, I often use this activity called IEIEC. I'm not great at naming this, but it stands for Ideas, Effort, Impact, Energy, and Commitment. And what we do is we, we choose a number of, of the ideas that came up on the, the ideas for action, the direct action, responding action, and, and persuading or influencing action. And um, we decide which of those we like the best. We might use one, two, four, all to do that, to collect all our ideas and then narrow them down to a handful. And then, um, then so we put those in the ideas for action column. Then we do a quick, just a quick round of how much effort do we think it would take for the team to do this action. So in the context of all of our other work, would that be, you know, we'd use, I usually just use t-shirt sizing for that. Would that be take a lot of effort? Would it take a immediate amount of effort? Would it be a small amount of effort? And then, um, then we dot vote on the third column, which is impact. Which of these would have the most beneficial impact for our team? Not which are the most important, but which would have the most impact? Because that's, that's where we want to focus ourselves. Uh, importance is too abstract. We want to think about real outcomes and impact that we're looking for. And then the next part is energy. Um, what do we actually feel enthusiastic about taking on? What do we really want to do? Which of these improvement actions really, you know, we think um, – would would feel good to move forward on and so and that usually is the deciding one and then we ask for um, okay who will commit to kind of shepherding that improvement action through our next sprint or our next iteration so rather than trying to get everyone to uh, come to some consensus or whatever, we use this dot voting thing and so it moves the decision making process on a little more quickly. Um, and then finally we close the retrospective. We have, we have an improvement action, we know the one or maybe two small things that we're going to carry forward. Uh, we, we, um, we're going to build on those. We may, if it's an experiment, we may have identified a hypothesis that we want to test out and, and built a, a, some kind of a, a 
improvement action experiment around that. Or we may just have said, you know, we need to be pairing more. Let's set up a pairing rotation. And somebody does that. So it can, the actions can look very different um, as long as they are something that the whole team believes is going to help move us forward. So then we close the retrospective. And to do this, we just want to wrap things up because the team may be then moving into sprint planning um, or it may be doing some other, other work and we want to kind of tie the bow on the retrospective so that things can move on. One of the things I often do is I will have people put a card um, in wherever they have on their task board, wherever they keep that, that has the improvement action on it so it doesn't get lost. It is actually a task, a story, depending on the size, that we are going to look at accomplishing in this next sprint. And so they take that into planning. So um, at this point, now we look at let's we're doing what we call a quick retrospective on the retrospective. Um, and one of the ways we do that is return on time invested. We, we can create this little chart. You can see I created this one in Miro. Uh, you can also do it on a whiteboard if you're together or any other kind of uh, platform. And the idea is to look at um, people's experience of participating in the, in the retrospective from the point of view of how valuable was their time, was the time that they spent. So it, the, it goes everywhere from um, this was a complete waste of time to um, this is a great use of our time. And we, the value we got far exceeded the time that we spent. Uh, and, then, and then you can even go beyond that if you like. And then I just always have the little dots already prepared in Miro so that people can just grab one and pull it over. I have multiple dots of different colors you can use. As you can see the top one, all pretty much one color of dot or in the down below, they can see multiple people could choose the same color so that it can be anonymous. Um, in the top one, you'll also notice that sometimes we add um, a little bit across the bottom of a roti that for people to put sticky notes about it that's also feedback on the retrospective um, what should we stop doing in the retrospective what should we keep doing what else might we try um, could we add and people can add in their uh, ideas about that Another way to do a retrospective on the retrospective is um, this little chart. And again, I created this in Mural. There's sticky notes. People can just go ahead and write things in or they can create more sticky notes. During this retrospective, what are we sorry about? And what are we proud of? And what are our ideas for next time? And what do we appreciate that someone brought to the retrospective. Um, I think offer appreciations is a very powerful activity. We describe it in the Agile Retrospectives book. It's in Retromat. It's in a lot of different places. Um, and, and this idea of letting people know when they have done something that was helpful to us, whether it's a team member, a peer team member, or someone uh, outside the team can be really important. So then once with the, so that was the end of the retrospective. It's all tied up. Um, the, whoever was facilitating can take that, the roti or the, or the retro and the retro information away so that they can think about how they can improve their, uh, facil their retrospective facilitation, how, you know, learning what kinds of activities the team likes, what kinds they don't like, and so on. But then the other part that has to happen now is to sustain the learning and improvement that, um, that we're embarking on. You know, we, we want to make this happen. And that happens after the retrospective. That happens as we incorporate our experiments and improvements into the next piece of work that we're doing. So we're planning to improve and learn. We're testing our hypotheses, running experiments, following through on our intention for action. And we have to have planned some ways to do that. And so that's also an important part of work for the team, to think about how that's going to happen. 
And uh, if you were in the talk that I gave earlier, uh, you know that this is an important thing, that learning leads to change. So every time we make some change in our product, our processes, our methods, our teamwork, um, then we know more. And we become a slightly different team because now we are a team that has that understanding, that knowledge, that learning. And, um, and we are changed. And that, but that also tells us probably at our next retrospective, maybe what the next thing we want to change is that it, it continues on in that cycle of learning and change. So in terms of team fluency and retrospectives, this is an important piece and I'm going to um, share this with you and then I'm going to stop for a moment and I'm going to um, show you what some of these are. So team fluency and retrospectives, each of the zones, you can see focusing, delivering, optimizing, and strengthening there in the, in the model, each of these zones has a certain set of proficiencies and team behaviors built into it that are the best fit for the expectations and needs and outcomes of the business that the team is serving, right? And so, as, as we move through the Agile Fluency model, we discover that different zones will have different focuses for their retrospectives. So I'm going to stop sharing now this part at least. All right. All right. Stop sharing that. And I'm going to start sharing. Oh, oh here we go. Start sharing Safari. And we're going to go to Agile Fluency Project to the, this is the blog page in the Agile Fluency Project. We call it Fluently Speaking. And you'll see there are three uh, blog posts here that are focused specifically on um, what does a what does a team need in each of the zones. So if you uh, download the Agile Fluency Model uh, article, and which is free on our website, and you read through that and you have a sense of where is my team, what, what, does, my, what does the business need from our team, and, and what zone do we need to be in, then you can think about, so for focusing teams, um, developing skills in three areas, correspond, responding to business needs, working effectively as a team, pursuing team greatness. So um, let's see here. And, um, and so then we're looking at um, how do we get, the, get good deliverables. So down here, so spotlight particular topics. How are we responding to business needs? How well do we understand? And so on. So each of these, um, each of these blog posts, depending on, so here's the one on delivering. Team members learn from their shared experience. They think and analyze joint discussions about their experiences. So in this one also, there is a section that gives some ideas about the spotlight for the, or the focus or spotlight of the retrospective for delivering teams and then also for optimizing teams. So that's a good place to look if you're trying to think about what might be the focus of our of our retrospective, and that's and it's easy to find that on um, at agilefluency.org. So let's come back over here, start this playing again. So. Um, so, you know, we can look at these and it will help us to understand, help us to clarify what some of those focuses are. And we can even slice them down a little further than what were in those blog posts. But I've got the links here so that you can, um, you can find them. I, I will absolutely share these slides if anybody's wondering about that. I will definitely share these slides and we'll be able to move on for that. 
So also this morning, I talked about the five rules for learning. They apply very much in retrospective. So when we are planning our retrospective, planning the flow of the activities, we want to make sure that we are keeping it alive, that there is, that there can be engagement. So that has to do with things like psychological safety, but it also has to do with planning group activities that the team it will enjoy, will like to do. We learn better when we are in, in a space of enjoyment than when we are not. So that's an important piece. And, um, and setting first, um, choosing, am I going to use Miro? Am I going to use Mural? Am I going to use Jamboard? Am I going to go to Retrium.com? Where, you know, where am I going to find the best setting, particularly for remote teams, for doing this. Um, I, I think it's primary for teams who, who are working remotely to be able to have video of each other as they are doing the work um, and video to do things like their retrospectives. So that may be the first thing that you want to advocate for. Um, if you are, are working on a team that has, is having to do pretty much everything over the phone um, and you can't see each other to do the work. That's, that would be a primary setting first to help keep it alive question for me. Uh, and then what we talked about doing it for real, we keep the retrospect. I don't, I don't use, generally do sort of silly icebreakers. I do those things that help setting the stage that help get people engaged, but I generally don't do the really sort of frivolous icebreakers because I want to stay focused on the work of the retrospective and the work that the team is doing. And so we want to stay focused on doing it for real. This retrospective is about real change, real improvement, real learning for the team. What is it that we need in order to make that happen? And so that's how, that's one of the ways that this rule applies in retrospectives. Start obvious, stay obvious, you know, having that agenda, staying, knowing what the focus is, staying really clear about what it is we're working on and what everyone's different experience of the sprint or iteration or release or whatever chunk of work you're working on is, is there. And then focus on flow. Um, always looking for just that next bite-sized piece, that next improvement action that we can accomplish together and how are we going to do that and, and making sure that, the, that the, it fits into the rest of the flow of the learning work we're doing every day as we learn about our customers, we learn about the behavior of the code and so on. And again, uh, here's a link to the book where we explain this. It's not a completed book. It's one of those lean pub books that's sort of been perpetually at 90%. <laughs> but there's a lot of good information there. And one of these days, we're going to pick it up and put in more. Uh, so I'd love to hear your stories about how you apply the five rules when you do your retrospectives. All right, what's going on here? Okay, there we go. And then the questions. Um, how can we create more aliveness? Um, how do we make our setting more conducive to learning? How do we get closer to doing it for real? How can we make learning more obvious? How can we size and sequence learning for a greater flow? These all apply in retrospectives as they apply in all the learning that the team is doing together. So now, now we're going to, in just a moment, we're going to move into um, you designing your retrospectives. So we will, um, I'm going to have to check the amount of time that this took, and then I will be joining you. But before we get into that, I just want to think about when you're designing retrospectives, some things to consider are, is it a co-located retrospective or is it remote and virtual? That's going to change some of the design choices you make. What is the context? Um, is this a release retrospective? Is it a Pomodoro retrospective? Is it, um, so there, and is it, um, is it a, is it a group of uh, only the engineering team? Is it 
is it other people involved? There's a lot of contextual issues to think about. Which team fluency zone are we looking at? How long do we have? Um, what I've noticed is, in general, for learning and thinking work, it tends to take longer with four remote teams than it does for, just not a lot longer, but it takes longer. We need to give more opportunity and, and allow for the technical glitches that come up and those kinds of things. So what do we, how long do we think it'll take? I usually, my, um, in general, m my first, where I start from is as a baseline is that for a two week iteration or sprint, I'm probably going to need, and a, and a team of seven plus or minus two, I'm probably going to need about 90 minutes and maybe a little longer, maybe two hours to do a retrospective that really helps move things forward, that really results in improvements. Um, and so if it's a smaller team, I might need a little less time. If it, we're looking at a uh, fewer number of days, we might need a little less time. If we're looking at a bigger team, a longer period of time, that that might be a reason to consider uh, uh, more time for the, for the retrospective. What's the focus going to be? What degree of complexity are we looking at, which might have to do with the context, it might have to do with the focus that we're choosing, might have to do with a lot of things. What kind of basic structure we're we using, um, and we'll talk about differences in that in a bit. Um, how, you know, how long was the relevant work? How big is the team? What was the, how much conflict was going on? Uh, how was there controversy during the iteration? All of those things would cause us the bigger they are would cause us to add uh, maybe more time to that we would need for the retrospective. So your design task will be to identify a real team, uh, describe the situation, think about those considerations, um, and then determine the improvement focus. I, I hope to keep your breakout groups pretty small. Um, maybe four, three or four people. Um, depending on how many people have showed up for this workshop, I may need to adjust that. Um, so um, you can either work as work together on all of your individual retrospectives or in your breakout group, you can decide to just pick one uh, that is a real team for one of you and design for one person, but then you'll have that design to take away and maybe apply to your own team. Uh, so you'll determine the improvement focus that you're going for and then choose some activities for set the stage, gather data, generate insights, decide what to do, close the retrospective. Try to find one or more activity per part um, and, you know, if you can't do that, you know, get at least one activity for as many parts as you can. Review the five rules. How do they apply in your situation? Assess the flow of your design. Does, does one activity sort of move into the other in a logical kind of way? Think about how you might sustain learning and improvement actions um, after the retrospective. And also think about what kind of facilitation skills is, are you going to need? And are you, do you already have those or do you, you know, is there some place that you could go to help um, increase your confidence, uh, your compassion and confidence and courage um, at taking on this facilitating the, the retrospective? And then finally, uh, create, we'll create a report um, and in your groups and then you'll have a chance for each group as or as for at least some of the groups again we don't know how many people are going to be here to report out their their designed retrospective and their outcome and then i uh, hope that we will also have some just time for q a after that so we'll have to figure out the timing um once we once we have once we know some of these other things so, what's your plan? Um, another piece that I wanted to uh, mention to you is there are lots of online resources, um, places for you to design your own. There's 
also what I didn't put here is there's also tons of sites that are set up to do retrospectives like Retrium and um, uh, there's some other ones like they're not coming to mind right now. I'm sorry, uh, but but to find activities if you're going to design your own, um, Retromat is great. You might find activities in liberating structures that are useful to you. Funretrospectives.com is a good place to look. There's a retrospective wiki. Um, that holds a lot of different um, group process activities and, and um, things that you can do. There's a LinkedIn group, a retrospective LinkedIn group that you can turn to to ask questions and um, see if you can, um, you know, if, you, if you're running into a challenge, get some feedback on it. Um, there is a new Agile, Agile Alliance uh, membership initiative called the Principle 12 Initiative that's doing a lot of work around supporting folks who are uh, both facilitating and participating in retrospectives. And then there's a wonderful podcast. Um, this is retrospectivefacilitation.com, um, which I've had the privilege of being interviewed on and a lot of other really great retrospective facilitators. So it's a good place to get new ideas. And there's a lot more, a lot more support online. Um, there are also books. Uh, Lean Pub has at least six books that I know are relevant to retrospectives. Um, the 50, 50 Quick uh, Ideas, the Retrospective Kickstarter. Um, and then there are books that are both come in ebook and in hard copy books from other publishers. Um, if you are just starting out and you have no retrospective books at all, you have no uh, resources, these are the two I would recommend you pick up first. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then any of the rest of these are great. Um, mo most of these other ones that are here under other publishers, I, I know I, I've got them here because I know them pretty well. Um, I think at least five of them I've written a foreword for. Um, and so I've I've had a chance to review them thoroughly, and I and I know they're really good books. So the retrospective handbook, which is more about facilitating retrospectives as a facilitator, um, not so much designing the retrospective. The retrospectives for everyone is a, a lovely group of um, metaphor ret retrospectives, which are a lot of fun. Uh, fun retrospectives has lots of things in it as well. Retrospective anti-patterns. I know Corey um, is, has shared things that she's run into over time that have tripped her up and how she got past them. Level Up uh, looks at the improvement kata, which is a, a very a kissing cousin to retrospectives. It is also an improvement process that you can use if you're doing more lean kinds of uh, development, and then um, Improving Agile Retrospectives by Mark Loeffler. So those are all great books. So thank you for this. Hang in here. Here's how to get in touch with me. Uh, write to me at info at agilefluency.org, or um, you can go to agilefluency.org and uh, use the contact form that's on that page. It's got a place to, to write in your questions or comments. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, it's pretty easy to get connected with me. You just sort of have to say you're agile and you're either a team member or a coach or somebody who's interested in helping people improve and I'll probably accept you. And then I'm on Twitter at uh, Diana of Portland. So I'm looking forward to moving from here into our Q&A and into our design experiment. So stick around. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you, Diana, for the lovely presentation. So now we have around 25 minutes um, for the rest of this workshop. So yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so my, my plan was to uh, do some breakouts, which I see that I don't have permission for, so, <laughs> so we're going to, so we're going to figure out some other things. Um, can you, please you know, say, can you please I'll say fascinating. What? 
Can oh, you there. See? Oh, now I do. Now I can do breakout rooms. So, um, but we've got a lot of folks who are um, not set up to be on video. It looks like, whoa, and we lost a whole lot of people. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I just very briefly, um, what I want to do is put you into breakout rooms. I just what we'll just do this for like five minutes so that you can talk to each other about you know what your questions are and what you want to bring forward we're, we're obviously not going to have time to design a whole retrospective but think through that design process and and ask your you know ask in your breakout group you know what what questions about that design pro designing a retrospective process do you have and then any other and so you can be um be ready to uh ask those when we come back together and you can either put them in the slack channel or in chat in zoom whichever is more comfortable for you and then we'll just go ahead and move forward so um looks like maybe two or let's see let's do I'm afraid to put you in three rooms so I'm going to just put you in two rooms um, we'll just be in for uh, we'll just be there for like six minutes uh, give time for everybody to to say what they need to say and um, and then we'll come back together and um, move on with the questions that you have. All right. Um, so write your um, write your questions in the chat or in Slack, and I'll I'll look both places. And while you're writing your questions in, so we can get them queued up, I'm going to answer Anya's uh, question that is already in the chat <laughs> here. <laughs> so um, so thank you for queuing that up. That's great. <clears throat> um, I don't know that there is a fluency model for Agile coaches in answer to your first question. Um, there are some coaching models out there for sure. And interestingly, my local user group has been working. There have been a, a few of us that have been working on sort of a model of the kinds of qualities that uh, Agile coaches uh, need to need to develop in order to move forward but um th but something specifically called a fluency model there is not just yet um there's some interesting things about the agile agile fluency model that's about team behavior of what kinds of coaches are needed when um but that's that's a little bit different topic um, and secondly, what do I think of a retro to help a team change, improve their fluency zone? That's really interesting because um, in at, at the Agile Fluency Project, one of the things that we have is a diagnostic. And that di the way we administer that diagnostic is in a retrospective format. Okay. So mm -hmm. it is an opportunity for we use the the ret, the diagnostic instrument, which you could use, you could create your own, frankly, from reading the 
the article and stuff. But so we have an instrument that is reflective of the article, and we use that to help the team gather data about what they are doing now. And then we look at their overall responses and compare that to what their leaders have told us is, are their expectations for them. And then we look at how close or far is the team from meeting the business expectations of the organization. And then we plan some improvement actions. We plan some actions that the team can take and we plan some actions that, um, that we, they can ask for from the leadership of the organization to improve the environment that the teams are in and, and improve their situation. So absolutely, a retrospective is a really great way of helping teams move through the fluency zones in a way that makes sense for them. So. Um, okay, thank you, Diana. You're welcome, you're <laughs> welcome. I'm happy to, to give um, you that response. So yeah, that um, question is a Pardon? Sorry, because I was just thinking, because I think it's hard for a coach, in a level one coach or zone one coach, to coach a team that sometimes is on zone three. Yeah. Well, the there. What's well? What's interesting is that um, focusing zone teams um, really do need a lot of coaching around collaboration skills, around okay. their relationship mm -hmm. with their product owner. They, you know, so they need to understand the why behind all the meetings that they need, um, or don't need, but they need to try them first before they decide they don't need them. Um, and, and then also that whole idea of shifting their thinking from building something according to components or technical specification. I mean, they have to meet specs, obviously, but but um, or or getting individual tasks to work fo to a change to focusing on what is going to deliver value or bring value to the customer and the business and building with that in mind, as opposed to maybe what's technically cool or, or some, other, some other lens to use on that. So we, um, we're definitely thinking about coaching in those areas when we think about focusing, when we think about coaching in the focusing zone. In the delivering zone, you still need some of that kind of coaching, but you also need technical coaches. You need coaches who can help a team learn to do TDD, to set up their pairing or their mob or their ensemble structure. They need team, you know, who can who can work with the organization to make sure that they have the internal production environments they need for uh, continuous uh, integration and then continuous deli delivery into that internals where it can sit and wait for the product person or somebody to say yes let's release this right so they they need technical coaching around how they interact with um, the DevOps such uh, situation in their organization how do they make sure that they're building something that is not only going to be great when they deliver it but also will be maintainable and sustainable over time for the folks who need to do that so that that needs that kind of coaching when you get to the optimizing zone, the coaching that's needed there is much more about how to work as a cross-functional team, how to make sure that the team has the business expertise and understanding that it needs, and, and how to, so it's much more, more business coaching by the time you get to optimizing. So, I mean, it's all cumulative. So we need the we need the coaches that can do the collaboration skills. We need the coaches that can do the engineering and technical skills, and then we need the coaches who are capable of doing the business skills and the connection with the customer kind of skills. The things that Kurt uh, that um, Kurt Carlson was talking about, right? Some of those things that he he was mentioning. So. Um, so, you know, it, it and it all depends on the coach 
and where they feel their sweet spot is to what kind of teams they will most gravitate toward and where they can be the most helpful. Um, a, a coach that primarily focuses on basic scrum skills and basic uh, collaboration skills and, and value, business value, understanding, um, probably isn't going to be a lot of need for that coach if you're trying to get to the optimizing zone, right? But, but most teams are in focusing or delivering zones. So there's plenty of work for all of us to do. <laughs> That's absolutely true. <laughs> so okay, who else has a you. question? We're down to only six of us, so you can just call them out. Annabella, do you have a question? I was talking uh, in the uh, first. Thank you for the talk. It was amazing. Thank you. And uh, now I have many, many things to to see and to 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 practice and to show to uh, to other colleagues in my in my yeah. uh, um, in my firm. And uh, what what I say uh, before in the the when I was in the other room, it uh, because I, I'm I'm not in the development team. I'm in a, in a support team. I was ah. because I'm, I'm I'm changing and I will do more uh, agile coach for the, all the the, the business mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. it will be more okay now I can uh, try these kind of things in many other teams and many yeah. different teams this is what will be very interesting and uh, but for yeah. the teams that we don't have uh, development and something to a product that only makes some kind of support of a product and don't work every day with the other kind uh, teams um right. what we can do this retrospect in the same way Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, I was approached by a publisher and I'm now working with a new co-author and we are we are writing a book about retrospectives much more across mm -hmm. the organization. Um, and we've been doing uh, many of us have been doing okay. that all along anyway, <laughs> but um, but we think it's a good idea to actually actually publish something about that. And I've been lately I've been doing presentations at um, meetup groups that are more like enterprise agile coaches that want to be able to use these across. So absolutely. Um, the retrospective format when at, back when Esther and I were writing the book, the original book. We had any number of people saying to us, well, why are you writing this book only for software people? Anybody could use this. And we said, yes, but, but agile software people are our people. And so that's who we want to talk to first, right? Um, and, and so that's been, that's been super helpful. But now it is time to move it out into the rest of the organization. And, you know, it's the same thing because what it, the, the framework um, the set the stage, gather data, generate insights, decide what to do, and close the retrospective. What that really is, and I didn't mention it in the talk, but what that really is, is replicating for a group of people how our brains work individually, right? That is the thinking process. When we do it, you know, oh, my coffee cup is too far away. I, I notice it's way over there, but I'm gathering some data. It's light enough that I can pick it up. I can, you know, it's, so I, I'll just move it over here, right? That is a process of gathering data about what's going on. You know, would I feel implications, gathering some, generating some insights about it. I'd, I'd really rather have it over here. It would be more comfortable for me to have it over here. And then deciding on my action and taking the action, right? That's how our brains work. But when you get a group of people there and their brains are all going, right? They need that support in moving through that process together so that they all so they have a chance to gather the data from what everyone has observed right and then generate some insights together sparking off of each other and then making a decision that they all buy into and then taking the action 
right? And so it really is moving that, moving that, um, that process of making a change outside of just the individual into the group or into the larger organization. And uh, so it can be done anywhere with any group of people. Absolutely. Yeah. So good luck and Thank best you. wishes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Tiago, did we meet last year? No. Oh, we didn't. Okay. I met somebody named Tiago last year. <laughs> I was wondering if it was you. <laughs> Do you have a question? Do you have yeah, a question? We were discussing, uh, and b besides a, a lot of uh, features and a lot of uh, frameworks that I didn't apply that you explained during our speech, yeah. it was very interesting. Uh, but for me, the, the main goal now is to keep the team, uh, everybody together while running the, uh, the retrospectives when we are working remotely. Uh, yes. do, do you have any, any guess on how to do that? Well, you know, it, it really isn't that different a process. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you figure out what you want to focus the retrospective on. You look at how can I bring these people together. Like I said, there's all kinds of tools out there, all kinds of recommendations. And, um, and if you need a little bit of a crutch, you can look at, um, there's, uh, there's the, um, there's Retrium, which is a wonderful paid service that you can use. There is, that will set up a retrospective for you. There is, but there are also some free services out there. So if you look for free retrospective tool and search on that. I know that um, Stride New York City, which is a consulting group in New York City that does agile work, um, they've created one that, that they make available to, to anybody. So if you need that to begin, you can, you know, you can look for one of those tools. But if you also have access to Jamboard or Miro or Mural or, you know, and, and you look in the um, other, other um, books and resources that I, that I had on the list, almost any of those can be shifted to online. And there are, um, uh, you know, like the ones that I showed you, you could, you could just use, instead of drawing something on a, on a flip chart, you draw it on Mural. And you pull over some little sticky note icons so that people can write on them. And it, it's not, it, you know, it just takes a, a shift of mindset to do that. What you want to avoid, <laughs> I was at a, I was asked to observe um, some things that were going on in, a, in an organization. And in one team there, they didn't, they hadn't hired enough. They were in the process of hiring more scrum masters, but they hadn't hired enough yet. And so the product owner was also acting as the scrum master, which is a real conflict of interest, right? <laughs> right, but he, he was trying to do the best job he could. But so I sat in on the retrospective that he held and what he did was uh, he you know, pulled up his, his computer and he put up a confluence page where he had created two columns. And he said, okay, so um, what, 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 did, um, what didn't go so well this time? And as everybody else said stuff, he typed it in. And, and then he said, okay, so did we, what did we learn? Typed in some stuff there. And then he said, okay, is there anybody we want to appreciate? And so people gave some appreciations. And he said, okay, so now we're done. And now um, uh, I have a few stories I'd like to have us do some refinement on. So since we still have some time, right, that conflict of interest, he's more interested in getting to his story refinement, which is his, yeah. jo his job as product owner, than in helping the team improve, which would have been the role of the scrum master. And um, 
I was, I was supposed to just sit there and observe and then give feedback later, but I couldn't stand it. And so I said, excuse me, can I ask a question? <laughs> and, and he said, well, sure. And I said, well, these lists you made, are you planning to do anything with those? <laughs> are you going to do anything about them? And, and the, you know, and I could see a lot of the people, a lot of the team members had their video turned off. A lot of them, you know, the ones that did have their video on, there were about nine team members. They were like sitting like this in their chairs through the whole, you know, and the minute I said, what are we going to do about these things? Are you going to take action on any of these things? What does this tell you about your team? Videos came on and people started learning forward. They said, yes, we want to do something. If, But if I hadn't said it, it would have been just another really super boring retrospect, big waste of time, really retrospective for them. And, and so that's what you don't want to do. You know, you want to make sure that you've got these activities that can help the team move through and it through that thinking process together, because that's how you'll keep them engaged. Right. And, Thanks. you know, read everything you can about it. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks. yeah. I think we are probably out of time. So thank you so much for uh, joining me in this <laughs> in this str kind of strange new world here of conferences. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I wish you the best for all your future retrospectives. And I hope things go really well for you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your thank too. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you. See yeah. You. There you go.